so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to add that we are recording, but um, we can edit um, any photo bombing, video bombing out if we need to. And just a reminder yeah. to switch off your phones, please, um, so that um, so we're not uh, under, uh, we're not disturbed. And I need to do that myself. So um, yes, welcome, and especially to our um, VIP, our athlete today, Joyce. Um, Oh, Alapado. No, Aladapo. <laughs> I'll get there in the end. <laughs> uh, welcome to Joyce Aladapo, who's now known as Joyce Hef Heffer. And uh, we've got some young people with us today as well who are going to help me to inter interview her. So just to say that my name is Anna Chapman and I'm Head of Service at London Lady of Learning. And we've, we're running a fantastic heritage project called Passing the Flame. And it's all about preserving and celebrating the achievements of great British athlete, athletes who've um, represented us for over 100 years. So an amazing, fantastic history. So we're very, very lucky to be enjo um, joined today by Joyce. Um, she is um, a fantastic athlete. Her, she's a long jumper and her personal best jump is 6.75 meters which sounds an awful long way to me <laughs> and she won a gold at the commonwealth games in 1986 in edinburgh in scotland so what we'd love you to do joyce please is just to give us a little bit of a history um, about your life maybe um, about what got you started and maybe your barriers challenges and um yeah, and, and uh, what you felt was your, your biggest achievements and what you've got out of your experience. Yeah. And then we'd like to um, kick off with some questions from young people. And as Piers pointed out, there's a little chat function at the bottom, a little yeah. uh, speech bubble. And if people could <coughs> send in questions via that, that would be wonderful. Um, so let's just start actually with the young people introducing themselves as well. So who you are and uh, where you've come from today please. So should we start with Jaden? Yeah, hi, I'm Jaden and I'm a mentor for London State of Learning. Yeah. And thank you, and Tasleem? You need to unmute Tasleem first. Hi, um, I'm one of the um, learning mentors as well. Hi Tasleem, if everyone else unmutes that would uh, help. And Sarisha? Hi, Sarisha. And we've also got um, Zoe, she's called herself Animation, and her daughter. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Alice, and I go to Forest Escape School. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And we've got Audra Bryan. Um, hi, I'm Audra Bryan, and I'm a sports ambassador at Erlen Primary School. Oh, wow. And, and who's with you? Yes. <laughs> My brother. Hello, what's, what's your name? Oh. My name's Gilbert. Hi, and I have dyslexia and I like playing sports. Fantastic, really? got some budding sports people today. So um, please could you put your name uh, before your question on the chat boxes below so that we know who's asking what question. Um, then we can give you credit for it. And we're now going to turn off uh, your video screens as well. Um, just that we've got a lovely full picture of Joy speaking, please. I've got some pictures I can show of Joyce if you want me to run the slideshow first. Um, yeah, that'd be brilliant. That's all right, Joyce. Nice. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Shall I start? Uh, yeah, uh, we've got some pictures coming up, Andy. One second. Oh, wow. In action. <laughs> was this your um, gold medal jump, Joyce? It wasn't. No, this was at the, um, that was at the uh, VA's, the National Championships, which was, must have been in 85. So I won that one. Wow. So that Fantastic. was one. Hmm. So, Basically, if I start from the very beginning, yes, um, I started training properly when I was 15. 
which is quite old because men, many people get into sports at a much younger age. Um, at school, I was always interested in lots of sports, played for the netball team, played for hockey, did a bit of gymnastics, not very well, mind you. But my PE teacher at the time um, said that she thought I had a talent in athletics. And I enjoyed doing all the events, even the throws. So she took me up to Crystal Palace one day and introduced me to some coaches at Bromley Ladies, which is now called Bromley Blackheath Athletics Club. So um, to begin with, I was really nervous about going. So I didn't know anyone and everybody seemed to know what they were doing and no, I didn't. So initially I didn't really turn up to training that often. Um, but as I got into it, you know, made friends, started enjoying it. And then my team captain um, introduced me to my coach called Terry Torpy and he was my coach for my whole athletic career so I started competing when I was 15 and I stopped competing when I was about 36, 37 so he was with me all that time and he played such a huge part in my life and I said to Anna before he was like a father figure and he guided me and he's made me person I am today. Um, now why did I start doing long jump? Well, I obviously I enjoyed all the athletics events uh, but to begin with I used to sprint and just do the sprints but I used to find I used to get so nervous before that event any sprint event um, and I just found that long jump there was sort of less attention on you you know the whole crowd wasn't watching the long jump event everyone was watching the sprints so I just felt a bit more removed and so that's how I got um, into long jumping. My inspiration at the time, so when I joined Terry's training group, there were loads of athletes he coached. Coach, most of them were out in their 20s. And I was 15. So initially, he didn't really want to uh, take me. There's a picture of Terry and myself there after I won the Commonwealth Games. Um, but he felt, I think I, I looked really sad, so he decided to take me on. And at the time, the whole of that group were really inspirational and so encouraging. Um, and really helped me to achieve what I did. Because when I started training, I was always the person at the back of the pack when we're doing our running sessions, whenever we're doing sort of what we call plyometrics, jump type exercises. I was always the one who was far behind, but I kept encouraging me, told me to keep going eventually. I found myself sort of catching up with some of the men in the group, which, which they found really hard, but then they also kept encouraging me, so I got better and better, which was good. Um, and the athlete, I think, who inspired me at the time was Carl Lewis. And um, for those of you who didn't know, he was an American sprinter and long jumper. And he won um, gold medals in the 100, 200 long jump 
melee in numerous championships, um, Olympics, um, world championships. So he was, um, I just loved the way he, he jumped and um, he was a huge inspiration. And I met him a few times when I started to get competing internationally. So that was just amazing for me. Barriers, what barriers did I face? Well, the nemesis for me was injury. I, I was unfortunately one of those athletes who fell in and out of injury. So um, I'd be competing, I'd go through all winter training and then come this season, I was injured. So that was my huge challenge. And in fact, that photo of me that you can see on the swimming pool was because before the Commonwealth Games, he dumped it, I started having the pain in my foot. And it turned out that I had a stress fracture. So leading up to Commonwealth Games, I wasn't able to train. So I had to go to the swimming pool and I did lots of training, running, swimming in water, just to keep it that going. So leading up to the Commonwealth Games, I didn't jump once. So I had two months of training, which was mainly weights, um, conditioning, circuit type training, and water. And I trained from there. So um, you can see the catchment says um, I got the gold with one leap and it was one leap because I went to the comp into the competition thinking yes I can make six jumps because you're allowed to, you're allowed you have three jumps and then the best eight get a further three rounds um, and so yeah I went to a competition thinking, yes, I can do all six jumps. I did my first jump, which was 6.43, 6 meters 43. Not my best, but I was so pleased with it because I hadn't trained for that long. And then um, come the second round, I got a long way and focused and determined. I started running, as I approached the board, I just felt I couldn't take, take off. And uh, if you look on YouTube and type in my name, Commonwealth Games, there'll be the first jump, and then you'll see another clip, my, myself running through on the second. And so after that jump, I sat through, and watch the whole competition, knowing that any one of those athletes could take the lead. And fortunately for me, nobody did. And hence the headline that I won with just one jump. So I was absolutely shocked and amazed that um, I managed to, to win. Um, also extremely thrilled because the season before was when I jumped my best jump which was 6.75 I actually jumped 6.80 that was been desisted so they didn't count it um, so I went to the games before at the end of the season has been one of the, of the favourites but for that season, I wasn't because of this injury. So to come out of it, the gold was was such a gift. I feel so fortunate. Amazing, um, really, really amazing, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> um, another um, one of my achievements. I, I was so fortunate, but I. I started competing probably when I was 16. When I was 15, I sort of dipped in and out. 
when I was 16, I started competing. And then when I was 17, I got my first Great Britain International. So that in itself was amazing. And um, I won, I won that match. And so everything just happened so quickly. Um, so, and then later on that year was European Juniors, um, where I competed for GB and I got the bronze behind um, that's an amazing Eastern European, Eastern, Ger East German long jumper called Heike Jesha. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of came through the ranks together and she won that and I came third. And again, I'll say thrilled with that. Um, and um, and another one of my challenges was that myself and my sister, who's called Georgina Alatpo, um, we were both international at the same time. My sister sprinted and she did a bit of long jump. But the press or the media were determined that there should be rivalry against us. So any time we were in the same competitions, whether she was sprinting and I was jumping, or we were both jumping, they would always try and make out there was this huge rivalry between us. And it turned out in the Olympic qualifying, I think it must have been for Los Angeles, my sister beat me there for the very first time. But unfortunately, in doing that jump, she bucked with her knee and was obviously in terrible pain. And the press were there with photos of me sort of trying to comfort her and really building up that rivalry, you know, saying that, oh, I'm so sorry, sis, that you hurt yourself, you know, trying to make out that I was pleased that she's hurt when actually it was, it was really painful. Um, and for that game, unfortunately, neither of us went. I had qualified early in the year, but they just took, I think, one, one athlete to those championships, so I didn't go. And there was another Olympics, I think the next one, where they had always have a qualifying standard. And you have to reach that standard before you considered for, collect, for selection. And I qualified for that game the day after they sent the team sheet out off to the Olympic Committee. So I didn't make that one either. Um, That's it. <laughs> but I, I didn't actually ever make the Olympics. But I think that year, the Los Angeles year, there was a boycott. So the, all the Eastern Europeans didn't go. So it's more like Western Olympics. But later on that year, um, they sent a team, a small, very small team of us to, to, they didn't tell us, they said it's an international meeting. And when we arrived there, you looked around and all you saw were um, athletes from the Eastern Bloc, like um, Kratos Vileva, who's an amazing 400 metre runner. Um, Marita Cock was another one, Heike Jeshra was there. Um, and then it turned out that this meeting was the Alternative Olympics, which was in Moscow, I think. So um, even though I didn't make the proper Olympics, I did um, compete in the Alternative Olympics. But needless to say, because it's all it was all the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, I made the final, but I didn't place. But again, that was an amazing experience. 
but one of one of my achievements obviously winning the Commonwealth Games and winning the European I mean coming third in the European Junior was amazing but one thing that I'm really proud of is that at the time when I was competing um, the Eastern Europeans especially um, were taking drugs to compete and it was well documented but nobody um, it wasn't as how should I say it wasn't as um, people weren't aware as much as they are now um, but the year I jumped 680 was I was ranked in the top 30 in the world and I felt so proud because looking at the names uh, on the rankings are so many Eastern European countries athletes who were possibly on drugs but I knew myself that I, I did that I achieved that absolutely clean um, and so I just felt so proud that I was able to be that, that high in the world um, having done it without any performance enhancing um, drugs so that was good um, so I've read a few notes. So, um, what did I achieve or gain from this sporting journey? A huge amount. I feel so, so lucky to have been involved in sport and to have had the opportunities that I've had and to travel as much as I have. Um, and I've travelled most of Europe, I've been to America, I didn't go to Australia but I've travelled so much, I mean during the summer, the summer season, um, there'll be time when, times when we're often on the circuit, you may have seen the Grand Prix on television, so you just travel from country to country competing. And it was it was just so heartwarming because everyone was in it for the love of the the sport, and we all grew so close. I mean, a lot of the uh, athletes that I competed with, I'm still in touch with now, here and abroad, because you just go through so much together, all the ups and the many many downs. So you do become so, so close. Um, but, I mean, for me, my, what did I achieve, what did I gain? I gained a father in my coach, Terry. He, he was a mentor, he was a coach, he was a life coach. I mean, when I was in my O levels and A levels, he would make me time to say, right, this time you train, this time you, know, you go to your studies. And he said, you know, don't, I don't want you to come out for athletics thinking, you know, what, what have I got in life? He, so he made sure that I was able to keep up my studies and train at the same time. And, um, so now I'm a teacher and I was teaching games and then after I had my children I retrained as a special needs coordinator so I teach all those with learning differences which I love um, and also yes athletics there's also a huge feeling of unity um then and i think part of it was because we loved it so much there was a bit of fine financial gain from it but nothing 
as, as it is now. So everybody was in it for the love of the sport um, and the safe friendship grew. Um, uh, well, so apart from the um, long jump, I also ran 100 metres because being able to sprint the same course in long jump. So I had the rest of 11, 9 and 100 metres, which isn't great. And then the 200, I ran 23, 7. Um, and at the time, I was also sponsored by Adidas, which I, for me at the time was just amazing. There was no, again, there was no financial backing. It was just kit. So every time, any time you need some kit to train or to compete, you just phone them up and they'll send you stuff. So that's a huge, huge bonus. Um, and then lastly, why is it important to preserve the heritage of athletics? Well, first of all, I, I think well, I feel that it's important that those up and coming sports people and, or, and athletes um, appreciate and recognise the achievements um, so, uh, in the past so that they can aspire to that. And also um, to appreciate. I mean, I say challenges, but it's, it wasn't a challenge then. But if you compare it to now, yeah, that to um, appreciate what we went through in order to get where we were. Because at the time, and this was in the 80s and 90s, and the 90s, we all trained and we worked. We had no nutritional information. I um, mean, I spent my most of my teenage years um, living on chips, so there was nothing to guide me in terms of nutrition. So I ate what I like, and I'm sure most athletes did. Um, There's no sponsorship, so you just had to train and do your own, your own work, you know, to, and to live. Um, so I just feel that that in itself made it a more of a caring and loving environment because we all knew what we went through to do what we did. Um, but I mean, athletics is just so universal and it's so all encompassing. You know, it does doesn't matter what, how tall you are, how short you are, your build, there's an event for everyone. So um, for that reason, I think athletics is a fantastic sport. That's fantastic, Joyce. And I mean, I love <laughs> athletics. I love watching athletics on television. And you're right, I think it's the stories, isn't it? It's the personal yeah. journey and the stories mm. from the individual. And, it's incredible and obviously you've got an amazing story um so we'd love to see you in action and i think i'm not going to get you to jump up and <laughs> do a long <laughs> jump for us oh um i'm going to um ask um pia to now run a, a video of you if that's all right we'd love to see you um at your height of your um performance if that's okay i think it's going to come up it's interesting you were talking about Carl Lewis because again I used to love watching Carl Lewis, mm -hmm. um, a, a massive inspiration. Um, oh, here we go! Very glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> so wow! For more games when you jump. <laughs> wow! Can we see it again, Pia? Oh, we're gonna look at hers. Oh, here we go. Look at that, complete perseverance, dedication there. Woof, wow, <laughs> fantastic. How tall are you, Joyce? Can I ask you that? Yes, five foot nine, okay. or one, 175. 
Wow. So we've got some lovely questions coming up. Um, so I'm going to ask you questions if that's all right. So to start, to start with, we've got a question from Sarisha and she would like to know what inspired you to start doing sports in the first place. So going back um, a long time ago, <laughs> we didn't have so much television, did we? We didn't have so much sport on television. So what inspired you? What made you aware of sports and, and got you into athletics? I think really it was school because um, at school we did many sports as I'm sure you did um, and I had this a PE teacher called Miss Askew who loved her obviously loved her sport and loved all sport and she was just so encouraging in everything I did and everything all the children did and if, if she felt that any of her pupils had particular talent she always tries to steer, steer them in that direction um, so she actually took me to Crystal Palace where I joined Bromley Ladies Athletics Club and um, yeah it all started from there um, but as I said earlier to begin with I wasn't keen <laughs> at all so I wouldn't turn up to train um but after a while um it became more enjoyable and um obviously when I met Terry my coach um the group there was so sort of willing and encouraging and inspiring that um I carried on but I think initially it's definitely my PE teacher that mm -hmm. goes it. And it often is isn't it lots of people are saying this so to our brand new members of staff our mentors that have come um, and joined our team you can see what an amazing impact um, you can have on young people so that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so Jane has got a question so it's, it is very interesting that um, you were eating chips, Joyce. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you didn't have the best diet. Um, so just... what did you do to, to kind of catch up and, um, you know, start um, really training and, and catching up with everybody? What, um, anything in particular that you did? Any particular well, regime or diet or something that um, you started to do to really make a difference? I, I was very lucky because I had a high metabolism, so I didn't put on weight. But um, what my coach did do, he, he, I had to weigh myself weekly, just to make sure I wasn't, I wasn't putting on too much weight. But in terms of diet, I mean, I say I eat chips all the time. I just don't. <laughs> I enjoy chips, and so I ate them when I wanted to. But my mother made sure I ate sensibly most of the time. But I mean, I think now the athletes watch their diet very carefully, and they are told what to eat and what not to eat. Whereas I ate what I like basically <laughs> so alongside eating you obviously had to do a lot of training so mm -hmm. um, from Zoe and Alice um, they want to know how long did you have to train each day so for our budding athletes um, really put us in the picture as to your commitment to begin with when I first started like 15 16 I was only training twice a week which is not a great deal but over the years I've built it up to just six, six days was the most I trained. Um, but I, never, I couldn't, I was one of those athletes who couldn't train too much because I was quite injury prone, so I had to be guided. So, for example, um, in pre-season, we'd often go abroad for warm weather training but I would 
as most athletes would train twice a day, I would only do the one session a day. Just and make sure that what yeah, you know, each session was high quality. So and just sessions would last anything up from up to an hour to two and a half hours. Um, it wasn't very long, was it? You had a very short um, um, opportunity to perform. Um, and we just wondered, Tasleen wondered what you did to calm your butterflies. How did you calm yourself to then be able to perform? All those hours and hours and hours of uh, working, what did you do to get yourself in, in focus? That's a very good question. So I think like any athlete before competition the nerves are raging butterflies are flying and you feel sick sick um but i think in a way you you need to use that 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 um feeling that feeling of adrenaline to get you going but to calm myself down before before warming up, I would always go and sit or lie down in a quiet spot and just breathe and just mentally rehearse um, each jump. So if, if you like, like visualisation, just visualise, you know, standing at the beginning of the runway, running through the jump, in your head going through every stride onto your takeoff. So that helped to help to calm me down. I mean some athletes listen to music. Occasionally I even read a book just to wow. take take myself out of that intense situation. Um just to calm things down. But Fantastic. but once once the competition starts, you know, that all the old nerves go because you're just so focused on the competition that, um, yes, you tend to be a bit more at ease once competition starts. And the real build up, I'm, I'm, I, sorry, I remember having so many sleepless nights before competition because of nerves mm. but um and i i think yeah that's all part of it uh, but i think it's important to try and channel yourself and find a way to relax so yes yeah, sit in the corner or reading <laughs> was my my thing i think that's very good advice for <clears throat> lots of things not just sport isn't it there's so much we can learn from sport um, lessons we can learn from sport um definitely yeah. if i could just i want to ask you a question um about some of the changes over the years because obviously you competed for a very very long time and um you mentioned adidas uh, them giving mm. you clothing so i just wondered what um might have changed in terms of perceptions of women and what you were wearing we've heard from athletes other athletes about um, sort of looking glamorous and having to wear a bit more makeup mm. or um, and I just <clears throat> wonder if you've noticed anything over the years that has changed in terms of the perception of women and um, yes their participation and even I guess with the coverage with TV and um, absolutely so, so when I was competing <coughs> excuse me, um, certainly um, it was very male dominated, so as they definitely showed the men's sprints and all the other events, the women's sprints and the track events got coverage. We, whenever we had footage of a field, women's field event, we jumped to high heaven because it was just so unusual. Um, so there's very very little coverage and also um, at that time selection 
for major major championships, Olympics or worlds or Europeans was really difficult. And um, often they would only take one female athlete in a field event. So it's really hard to get into the state team. But I, over the years, I've noticed that um, there's certainly more exposure um, for women in all events and and field events. I mean, <clears throat> before, I mean, you probably haven't heard of me, but n now I'm sure those involved in that phase or interested will know the names of all the top long jumpers, all the top high jumpers, male and female. But it wasn't quite that. There, there wasn't it. There was an inequality at that stage. Um, and also, I think um, there's a lot more opportunities for female athletes in terms of advertisement, mm. television, um, media opportunities, um, which is fantastic. Mm. I mean, it's, it's good to see that that sort of thing evolving because um, it certainly wasn't. And yes, athletes now, now do glamorize themselves. They mm. do wear makeup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, some, when I was competing, some of them did. I mean, I, I, was, I used to compete, I don't remember, Flo Jo? Yes. So um, she is interesting because she's the one that was, she wasn't into us, she was doing really well. She wore makeup, but not a great deal. But when she became Flo Jo, you know, she, you can, the fingernails, the hair, yeah. she really glamorized herself and promoted herself. But that was right, you know, that was a time where people were looking for female role models for promotion. So in that sense, she sort of highlighted that for Wings Athletics. Um, but it's the same time to, to see the change. Mm. So um, anybody, you know, girls who are interested in sports, you know, keep persevering because it's um, sport is such a valuable tool, life tool. I mean, I've I've gained so much through sport, um, and. And it helps me in my teaching as well. So, um, yeah, I just feel, you know, doing sport provides many opportunities beyond what you actually do in that event or discipline. Thank you. And Does that answer your question? Yes, and just very quickly to add to that, and then we've got some other questions, I'm going to jump in and be selfish but I'd really like to know about some of the um, technical aspects that might have changed so um, some of your apparatus um, like the sand or um, the plasticine or runways that you ran or um, or even clothing uh, because um, technology has changed hasn't it and uh, now it's more advantageous I think um, to athletes and um, sometimes there's a debate, isn't there? Like the latest trainers for long distance runners, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so those, you know, those differences that you might have noticed over the period that you were competing. Hmm. So um, in terms of kit, I mean, we all had standard kit. So best, I'll show you one. It's my... Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> So uh, actually, I have sent some photos of myself wearing this vest. Fantastic. Now, this vest is from Germany, SB Cologne. And I shot this for a Great Britain uh, vest. 
and I can play deep. Actually, no, when I, I was training, one, one of the athletes um, talked it with me, and this was my favourite bits. <laughs> and if, if you have a look at some photos, you'll see that I'm wearing this. This must be, gosh, this must be over 20 years old. Wow. <laughs> But I've been, um, yes, I wore it for quite a few competitions. I, I always did well, so I kept, kept wearing it. Lucky. Mm -hmm. Have you got Lucky. any other memorabilia with you, Joyce? Anything yes, else? So, so yeah. this, was, this was the last vest that I competed in. It's an England vest. Fantastic. So, um, and for that match, I was made um, team captain, so I was very proud of that. After that was in two thousand and two, I think, or two thousand one. Yeah. Um, when we, whenever we had a match, I'm sorry, I haven't got much in the way of memorabilia because most of it's at my mother. You're the third I person to go and see that. that. <laughs> Joyce, you're the thing. It obviously gets put away with someone who's really going to look after it for you. Um, yeah. Part of this project is about uh, the preservation and celebration and preservation. So we're hoping that not just our young people and teachers, um, youth workers that will benefit from, from seeing your artefacts, but we're hoping that it will also support athletes to preserve their own um, special artifacts, their own stories themselves. So we're hoping that this project will do the same. So we will get pictures of these things, Joyce. We'll track you down and uh, we'll try and get some of these pictures, um, some some three D digitized images as well, um, up on our website. Yeah. So we've got a few more questions, if that's all right. Um, yeah. Um, so. We'll start with what kind of opportunities has your athletics career opened up for you um, since retiring from sport? What opportunities have you had? Um, well, to, at first, when I first retired, there was a tele television program called Gladiators. Oh, yes. Yes. And so I was asked to take part in that, but I, unfortunately I had to refuse because well, speak, uh, I spoke to my coach about it and um, I, I just started a teaching job and I would have, it would have detracted, I couldn't commit at that time. So, that was a, a huge opportunity. Um, I was also asked to um, present, be, be one of the presenters on, I can't remember, a Sponda Sporting, um, I can't remember which one. But yes, it has opened up many opportunities and also it's helped in my, you know, careers so when I go for interviews um and you obviously have your CV and you write down all you've done I think having had that a sporting background and achieving that background um means that you have many qual qualities they can channel into other other areas so um Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it, I think this might be a nice one to, to wrap up with, but you talked about being a captain um, of your team and obviously you're put in that position if you're very inspiring and um, can support others. And um, so we've got a question from Zoe and Alice saying, what advice would you give to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Uh, you've got to be committed. You've also, for me, I think it's all about enjoyment. If you're enjoying what you're doing, you'll do really well. Find someone 
or a group of people who will support, support you because that support is anything because there are so, so many downs and compared to the ups, there's more hard times than there are good times. So you need that support and encouragement behind you. Um, and yes, having a good, a good supportive team around, be it friends, be it coaching group, being family, I think as long as you have that support and belief in yourself, um, you'll get there. Oh my goodness. Well, a bit higher up. Fantastic. <laughs> I love the, the Queen's uh, crown on there. That's mm. fantastic. <laughs> was it heavy Joyce? It is it's quite heavy. Yes. Well and then thank you. After the Commonwealth Games, you're quite invited to the Queen's Garden Party. Oh fantastic. <laughs> wow. So fantastic. Lots of fantastic things. Do you have any special memorabilia? Um, that might not be a medal that uh, that's most significant to you? Not here. What, what <laughs> is it? Can you describe it for My us? spikes. And ah. My spikes. Because they do the work. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, guys, if you're still there, anything that you want to... Um, say to us that you're going to take away from this interview um, would be fantastic. Jaden, is that you with your hand up? Yeah. No? yeah, go for it. Oh, I think um, how she um, said she started like 15, like how late she started, because usually like people have been doing the sport from young mm -hmm. and they like are very experienced, but when you start late, it's harder to catch up and in fact she caught up, I think it's quite impressive. Thank you, Jada. Thank you. That leads me to say to you, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll, it will be fantastic to have what you've done today um, on our website. And, um, and we're hoping, Joyce, that we might be able to bring lots of athletes together and create some kind of webinar. And then you could possibly share some of your stories together and we can mm -hmm. have really great conversations um, about what happened you know in the 1980s 1990s be so uh, good so we'll be back in touch with you anyway but thank, thank you so you. much and we really appreciate it so no, thank you say goodbye thank to everybody you. now thank, thank you for you joining very much. and uh, we'll speak bye -bye. to you very soon thank, thank you Joyce you. bye bye bye, bye.